Okay, so today, echoes again, back to echoes just for a little bit. So, so the plan today is to first, uh, it, it's sort of picking up something that I didn't quite finish, which was when we had like three, if you have th three RF pulses, you get uh, four echoes after it, and a, a, some, some in between, and then four echoes after it. And I didn't go over the, um, the equations for the strength of those echoes. And, and what's the relevance of this? The relevance of this is that if you're trying to calculate for a given kind of pulse sequence that might have a stimulated echo in it, uh, if you're trying to calculate what would be the best settings in order to get a uh, to get the best contrast, then you would need to you would need to know this equation. So it's the it's the equation uh, like the ones in the homework for gradient echo. So we, we should go over the the basic equation for stimulated echo, so you can see what what that looks like. And I can slightly review that. So th so that's the first part. And then the second part, um, I have a paper in the readings that you can check out on hyper echoes and. Uh, so the idea here is just yet another, it's to really sort of uh, have a concrete appreciation of what the phase of the RF pulse does. And what is the phase of the RF pulse? And then, you know, what, is, what, is it, what does it do? And it's, it's basically just, it's just visualizing the magnetization vector on a sphere. So, um, so... Um, it uses a different coordinate system, unfortunately, so I'll have to go over that just for a tiny bit, but I've translated it to, to the coordinate system that we've been using uh, using in this class. So that's the second part. So, so back to echoes. So, so our first, uh, that, that first diagram about what if we do three RF pulses instead of just two? So if we do you know, one RF pulse, and then I uh, have another one, and then a distance that's not exactly the same, so we can see uh, see the, see the effect. So here's uh, so here's the, the the first pulse and the second pulse and the third uh, pulse. And so what do you what do you get out of that? So you get a whole forest of echoes out of that. So the first thing you get, you get some FIDs from uh, these RF pulses. That's the T2 star. So you get three FIDs. And then the first thing uh, is a spin echo. So that's just that distance, distance afterwards. And we get a spin echo from those first two. And so that one is, uh, so this is, you know, FID1, FID2. This is spin echo from one and two. Uh, and that, then the, the sort of the complicated echoes uh, come up. And so uh, the first one is this, it's an echo made by uh, this one acting as if it was, uh, this spin echo acting as if it was a, another FID. So that one has a bunch of focused spins and in the middle it acts just like we had just done another RF pulse here. And so if you take that amount of distance afterwards uh, there, you can see there's another little echo that appears, secondary echo. So that one's called, that one's called uh, secondary. Uh, then, then you've got a, a, a spin echo from one and three. So here's one and one and three. So basically that, that distance, that distance afterwards, there's going to be, uh, it's going to be a, a spin echo little one. So that's that's one and three. Spin echo one and three. And then there's one from two and three. So so two and three that amount of time 
Afterwards, there's another spin echo there from two and three. And then last but not least, we have that, that uh, stimulated echo. And the stimulated echo was this. So a spin echo is when you just do two RF pulses, and then you get an echo the same distance afterwards. Uh, so this, this time is tau one, and that's tau one again. And then this time is uh, tau two. And this time, this time here, you could call it tau three, but it's actually, it just equals, uh, you know, tau two minus tau one. So, so th those are the regular spin echoes that just have two RF pulses, and you've got a couple ones out here. But then the stimulated echo, the way it works is it requires three pulses, and you do, you do two pulses, and then the, di the distance uh, between the first and the second after the third. So if you take this distance here and then put it after the third, and that's where the stimulated echo will appear. And the stimulated echo is much bigger than the um, than the spin echoes at the same at the same time. So that one's called a an STE, and that that requires one, two, and three. So it requires uh, uh, three RF pulses. So that's the whole forest of echoes. And you can see from this that if you you know if you did a, th a thousand RF pulses in a row, it's going to be just this rat's nest of echoes on top of each other. So, uh, but if we just leave it at this and just go over uh, our equation, so our, we had equation for, uh, I'll just go over this one again. So uh, uh, the spin echo, uh, one, two. So the equation for that one, uh, the, the general equation for the amplitude of that, you know, which, you know, equals, you know, mxy, uh, at the peak of it, it, the general equation is the sine of alpha 1 times sine squared of alpha 2 over 2 uh, times e to the minus 2 tau 1 over t2. So that's the so that was, looks like kind of a mess, but we had two special cases. And so, so one special case is uh, alpha 1 equals 90, alpha 2 equals 180. And so if we do that, uh, then what happens is, uh, you know, sine of 90 is 1, so we can get rid of the signs. And then sign, this is also sine of 90, uh, is also... Also, also one, and so we can get rid of uh, get rid of that guy, and uh, so if you boil that down, then you just get um, uh, e uh, e to the minus two tau one over t e uh, oh, oh sorry over t two, and usually we call uh, you know, this guy, TE. So that's the equation that I, I was always writing up from the beginning. Uh, e to the minus uh, time of echo over T2. So that's one special case. Uh, and the other special case that you'll often see, so if you're just reading papers, you know, you just read through and you say, like, where does this, you know, sine cubed come from? So, so that's one special case. But another special case, which is often uh, often used, is if you make uh, if we make um, two alpha one equals alpha two. So basically, if we just make the and what what what's the units here? It's just this. It, it's just the flip angle. So two if, if the first 
if this second flip angle is just twice the first flip angle, that's what that means right there, uh, uh, then you get another special case, which you often see, uh, which is uh, sine cubed, uh, because in that case, you know, uh, you've got this guy is uh, twice, uh, you know, this guy's twice, and so you divide them, and it ends up the same as this, and you can combine the signs. So it's just uh, sine cubed of alpha 1 times e, you know, to the minus t e over t2. So you'll often see that one uh, just because people have, have actually happened to make this second pulse twice as big as the first. So, so that was the original, so th but this is the most general, general equation. So once you start sort of going, going down there, it turns out the, um, uh, the secondary echo, secondary echo, so that's, so that was this uh, spin echo. The secondary echo is already sort of getting a little bit more of a mess. So the amplitude, you know, equals uh, secondary echo. And so, yeah, so this, this guy, this guy was the echo at, you know, t time t equals 2 tau 1. The secondary echo is kind of confusing, but you can work it out. It, it's actually uh, 2 tau, uh, it's 2 tau 2. Uh, so this, this one right here, because this time, you know, this time it's going to be equal to, you know, tau 2 minus tau 1. So when you, when you add up all those things, you end up with, strangely end up with 2 times tau 2 is actually the, uh, the time of, time of that echo. Um, so what does that one look like? Uh, it's also got a negative on it because of the way you're sort of flipping and then flipping. So it's, it's a minus uh, sine alpha and then times sine squared uh, of alpha 2 over 2. That's the same. Uh, but then you've got another uh, sine, sine squared in there of alpha 3, because this one actually depends on all, all three echoes. It's like a stimulated echo, but not like a stimulated echo, because it doesn't have any, uh, it doesn't have any t1 dependence. And so then times e to the minus 2 tau, make sure you got 2 tau, 2 over t2. Okay, so quite a mess. So, so that's the, uh, that's the amplitude of the uh, secondary echo. And then th the one, the main one that we wanted to talk about here was uh, the stimulated echo, which is usually written like that, ST, stimulated echo. So the amplitude of this guy. Um, and so what is the amplitude of this guy? Uh, where is the, this thing occurring? It's occurring at time equals... Um, two of these tau ones, because it's tau one after the, it, it, it's this amount of distance after this, uh, plus tau two. So that's the, the time that it's occurring. And so this guy, uh, is uh, equal to uh, sort of another complicated mess. So uh, one, but this one is has some t1 dependence in it. So, so it's just the sine of that times the sine of alpha one times the sine of alpha two uh, times the sine of alpha three times e to the min minus tau two over t one. So that's the and then times e to the minus two times tau 
and 1 over t2. <laughs> okay, so that's the, this is the unique thing here. So this guy is t1 dependent. It's still a decay, so it's not a regrowth, because um, uh, this, this thing is another decay term. It will be under, you know, under 1. You're multiplying by something less than 1, but uh, it's got this t1 dependence in it, and t1 is much less of a decay than... Um, than T2, and so, so it's, it's being decayed by the first echo time, but then this one is only being decayed uh, by, the, uh, you know, by a T1. And uh, so then there's, there's yet more equations. I won't write them out, but if you write out the, if you write out the one for uh, spin echo 2, 3, that's also T1 dependent. So... So spin echo, because there's another, there's this third, a uh, third pulse that, that, that's involved in there. So, so the amplitude of that, that one occurs at, at time um, t equals tau one plus two tau two. So here's the, the times that each one of these are occurring. So that one equals uh, T1 dependent also. And then there's this, then there's spin echo uh, one, three. That one's not, you know, not T1 dependent, et cetera. It's on, it's on the notes. So, so this one, uh, th this one is, is, is a worthwhile one to sort of like calculate what that, what that amplitude is. So, um, and like I said, you, uh, w where are we going to use this? So we'll come back to this later and actually uh, look at, because it has a different dependence uh, on than the standard spin echo does, one of the things that, so one of the, one of the problems that we have uh, with trying to get a quantitative number out of the out of an MRI image is that there's a lot of things that affect it, T1 weighting, T2 weighted, maybe it's a little diffusion weighted, et cetera. But there's another thing that affects it, which is the actual flip angle. And so we said that the way the flip angle works is you start off the scan. First, you figure out what the center frequency is, just empirically, by doing an RF pulse. Then you figure out what a 90 degree, how much power, RF power do you need for a 90 degree flip? And you just figure that out by which one gives us the most transverse magnetization empirically. And that varies, like it varies by weight. So if you put a bigger body in there, you'll need a slightly different RF power to get, to get the same 90 degree flip on average. Um, and so that's good, but the problem is that it varies in different parts of the, of the head. And this is especially a problem as you get up toward uh, higher fields. So, so what happens is the uh, it, you could have a, a large variation, like 25% variation in the actual flip angle that occurs. And you, can, you could just measure this easily by just trying a bunch of different flip angles and then seeing where the maximum is at each, uh, at each point in the head. And you can see like the maximum will be, you know, it might be 25% different. And so given that we know that from the, the equations, the, if you're looking at a, say, a gradient echo scan, fast gradient echo scan, the the actual brightness dependence on flip angle is, is very, you know, if, if you're off by like say 20% uh, in the flip angle, that could flip your gray-white contrast. And so, so it's, a, it's a big effect because, the, because especially at higher fields, the RF doesn't penetrate uniformly into the head. Uh, and so uh, because of that, you, you might want to try to do another scan to calculate what the flip angle actually was. And so one way of doing that is because you have this different dependence, uh, dependence on flip angle between the stimulated echo and the spin echo, you can collect a stimulated echo and a spin, e uh, spin echo and solve for the flip angle. And we'll, uh, I'll go over that. So that's, that's kind of like the preview of why we want, might want to pay attention to this fine, 
find equation for how uh, stimulated echo brightness is controlled. Okay, so, so any questions about return to echoes? Echoes again. And remember, like, you know, if you're actually collecting a sequence, you know, you're making the image by collecting data throughout the entire echo, but the the center of the echo at the center of k-space is a particularly important data point that has a very outsized effect on what the image actually looks like. And so that's the, that's the reason to um, sort of pay attention to these echo amplitude equations. And they're, only, they're, only, they're all just referring to just that single point at the the single maximum point at the middle of the echo when you go through the center of k-space when all the spins realign. Okay, so now let's talk quickly about hyper-echoes. And really, the, the hyper-echoes hi, hyper aren't that important. It's just, it's just more just talking about um, thinking about what controlling the phase of the RF pulse does. So that's, re that's really what we want to talk about. And so, so what is the, the phase of the RF pulse? So, so it, in our regular coordinate system, uh, we have a situation where we've got some arbitrary M vector so say we got an m vector here, and here's where it here's where it goes it projects down to on the plane. So it doesn't have to be right along the. So here's the z axis and the and the x axis and the y axis. So it doesn't have to it doesn't have to actually be uh, along the x axis. It could be anywhere, and then. In general, uh, we've got some some b vector, and w this is this is remember in the uh, you know rotating core rotating chords. So these these vectors are stopped. So they're stopped, and and then we have the b one vector, which is the the rotating transverse magnetization that the RF coil causes. Uh, and that one also doesn't have to be uh, in any particular, particular axis. So say this guy uh, projects down to the plane here. And so we've got uh, uh, additional phase angles here like that. So so this guy is the is the B1 vector. B1. Also stopped because that's rapidly rotating, but let's assume we're we're at the same uh, same resonant frequency. And how do we calculate the effect of that? Well we can just do um, we can just you know just do uh, you know M you know cross cross B. Uh, and we've zeroed out the B0, so <coughs> it would just basically sort of be M cross B1. And that will tell us, you know, that this guy is going to, like, go down that way. Uh, but <coughs> they don't have to be at right angles to each other. It can be at any old random angle. They can be any old phase angle. And so, um, so what, is that, what does that phase angle actually mean? So this is... This guy is, you know, the phase of the M, and this guy is the phase of the B1. So, so what does the phase of the M mean? So the phase of the M just means uh, where that vector is around the circle relative to time t equals zero. And we said what, who defines time t equals zero, the transmitter defines time t equals zero. So the transmitter puts out this 123 megahertz signal, uh, and, you know, you start up the transmitter, and now we've got, like, you know, a time reference. That transmitter is extremely accurate, so the transmitter can do, like, you know, a 
couple seconds of 123 megahertz, 123 million cycles per second, and it, will, it won't get off by even a fraction of a cycle uh, after seconds. And so we could turn the transmitter off, but keep time, and then turn the transmitter back on and be exactly in the same um, sine wave that we, that we started from, from the beginning, because there's a clock in there. And so what is the phase of the RF pulse? The phase of the RF pulse is what, you know, where are you uh, doing that oscillation relative to a single cycle? And so if I, so after like 10 seconds, I can say, okay, I'm going to start the transmitter up again, and I'm going to move it f a quarter cycle ahead, you know, 123 millionth of a, of a second ahead. That's what the phase means. Uh, that's what the phase means of the, tra of the, of this transmit field, and that's what the phase means of this rotating ma local magnetization. It has a, a particular phase too, which is could be different from the, the transmitter phase. So that's so that's what the real meaning of the uh, of the phase is. And like I said, the transmitter defines where time t equals zero, and the transmitter can keep really good time. And so you can uh, you can just you know define not only that the transmitter is starting, but what phase is the transmitter starting relative to when it started, you know, when it, when it started from the very beginning of the, of the scan when you, when you said time t equals zero. So that's a confusing, it's a very confusing uh, thing initially, at least, at least it was for me. So that's the phase of the B1, and then the phase, the different phase of whatever it is of the local magnetization m vector. So so the problem now, you can see, well, you've got a whole sphere, basically, and so of, of possibilities. So the m vector can be sort of, if, can, can be pointing anywhere around a sphere. And so the visualization we're going to use is, let's just forget about the length of the m vector and just imagine like, you know, okay, now we've got a sphere of possibilities of where the m vector could be. And what is this visualization? Well, we're just, you know, we've got a primate visual system. We're just trying to flatten things back down to approximately two dimensions and a sphere, the surface of a sphere, is kind of like just a two-dimensional picture. It's curved, but you know, otherwise it's sort of 2D-like. And so we're sort of squishing some complicated situation back down to 2D. That's, that's really what the goal is, to sort of allow our minds to understand it. So, so unfortunately, this paper is using a different coordinate system. So, so here's a sphere. And um, so, so this paper is the, and, and, and uh, uh, there's another guy who starts with SCH, uh, I can't remember the guy's name, um, but it's, uh, <coughs> it's 2001 if you want to look at the paper. Um, so, so here's our sphere, and if I draw kind of great circles around our sphere, like this, And you imagine like here's here's like the um, three axes of the coordinate system which you know, meet in the center of that sphere. So it turns out there's two different kinds of coordinate systems. So so they're using what's called a right-handed coordinate system. So there's several different ways you could move the coordinate system. So, I mean, I could just take this coordinate system and move the z, you know, pointing to the top. Uh, but it turns out, uh, so, so we're distinguishing these two types of coordinate systems from just the orientation of the coordinate system. So we could put the coordinate, we can take this ball and rotate it however, the, however we want. But if we do, there's no way where you're going to get back to our original coordinate system, which was like this. Uh, so it had an X here and a Y and a Z. So this is our standard left-handed chords. So this guy's a right-handed coordinate system. So there's actually only two uh, types of coordinate systems. Two, there's two possibilities of sort of arrangement of the coordinate system in, in 3D. They're mirror images of each other. So if you take, so we could turn, uh, you know, our coordinate system into a right-handed coordinate system by just saying, let's have the positive x point in this direction instead. 
that that would flip it and, and make it into a mirror image. Okay, so so in their paper, not only is it a right-handed coordinate system, but it's oriented with the z-axis off to that. <laughs> and so if you look at it, it's just like uh, I can't I can't get it. So so what we're going to do is we'll just translate it back to our standard standard coordinate system. And so so what's the point of this paper? So the point of this paper is, well, you're doing a lot of RF pulses. And a lot of times the magnetization, you're doing RF pulses before the magnetization has died away. And so you're, you're moving the, the, the M vector all, all over the place. And you know, how do we visualize that? And in particular, how can we generate a really big echo? Because we want like a big signal to record. And so that's the hyper, the hyper echo is like a really big echo. So how can we get a big echo after we've been messing around recording a bunch of lines of K-space so you know we're going to be recording a whole bunch of lines of k-space with smaller echoes because we don't care about them as much because that's just the higher spatial frequencies. And we, but we want at some point to get the center of k-space having a really big echo. So that's that's kind of uh, that, that's that's the goal here. So keep the goal in mind because uh, it gets kind of hairy. So so basically, what th the way that they're visualizing the 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 B field moving things around is so you know what moves M. So several things move M. So one of them is the RF, but another thing that that moves M is uh, little B zero offsets, uh, like the star part of uh, of T two. Those will also mess with the with the phase, the phase of M. And so, so the first thing is, uh, first thing is the pulse. So, you know, the RF pulse, and the RF pulse has a particular angle, and then it also has a particular phase. So this is RF pulse. Uh, but the other thing uh, that, that moves it is, uh, in the paper they use this, way of drawing a small lowercase v. Uh, the other thing that moves it is the, is the actual uh, B0, uh, B0 offset. And so that B0 offset uh, is, is a particular frequency offset because we're only looking at, to simplify things, we're only looking at one frequency offset. Of course, like there's a gazillion frequency offsets in different parts of the brain, but let's just We'll just do one, and if we do one, then the other one's going to be the same. So, um, so there's a particular frequency offset. You know, we put a bit of delta in there. Uh, frequency offset, and then that one depends on how much time the, the frequency offset has has been happening for. So, so this is you know dephasing, and this one, this one. Uh, is applied, you know, around, uh, up, you, you can uh, alter what the phase is of this one. And what does that mean? It means like, you know, where is it around the, this XY plane? Um, this one uh, only dephases around the Z axis. So, um, so this one is, um, you, know, you know, around Z axis. So whereas this one, we, this one we can adjust the flip angle, and so that can change, uh, that can change where we are in z. Whereas this one just sort of rotates around in the xy plane. Okay, so those are the things. Uh, those are the two things. And so once we have that, now we can sort of look at some, uh, look at some uh, cases. And so what they did was they said, uh, if, if we have this sphere of possible places that the m vector could point to, uh, can we make some rules of what kind of operations using these two things uh, are equivalent to each other? So, so the first one, uh, let me draw it, I'll draw it bigger this time, last time. So the first one would be something like a, a spin echo. So let's, let me draw my spheres first. So here's one, two, and three. 
sort of sphere-like. Okay, and now let's draw the our coordinates in here. One at a time. And All supposed to be great circles, even though I didn't do that good of a job. Let me make this one a little bit darker. Okay, so we got we got three spheres of places that the m vector could be. So if we're ignoring ignoring the length, so and just considering where the m vector is pointing. And so the first one we'll do is uh, is a a spin echo. So, so the so the rule for this one is, if we do you know any old phase of our RF pulse, and then we do a 180 uh, around the around the y-axis, and then we do a another pulse, the the same. Same phase of that guy. Is that right? We do, yeah. We'll do um, around the same axis as that guy. That's going to be exactly equal to just a 180. So we'll see how this works. And so the the, the coordinates here are the are the same ones we've been using, which is uh, so. Here's the this is the z direction and. This has the, so I forgot to do these. So these uh, all are supposed to meet, sort of. Okay, here's that guy. That guy. So these are all supposed to meet. And last but not least. Okay, so we got all our spheres set up. So now, now we want to actually uh, do something. And so, uh, the first thing we'll do. So imagine we had, you know, our starting condition in that you know, along the z-axis. So let's put this, let's put our axis in. So this is x and y, y, x, z, z, x. Y. Okay, so we start up there, and then we do a we do a flip down to the y. So so now we're going to at some um, starting phase. So let's let's just have it go to say here. So. So that's the, the <coughs> that's where we're starting, and so then we do a uh, a certain amount of uh, of uh, dephasing. Sorry, this 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 is dephasing around. So this is dephase. Uh, you know, this is an actual flip. Sorry, I, I I said it wrong before, and this is dephase. Okay. So, so now we're going to dephase for a while, and uh, let's just say we're um, dephasing in um, so this direction. So that's our dephasing. So that's our first thing. So this guy is the is our uh, dephase around the z. So you do a flip, and then we do some dephasing, and we, we're just assuming there's just one magnetic field offset, but the same argument would apply for vectors that were in. There might be a different amount of dephasing some other place. Let's just do one. Okay, so now what we do is we do um, a uh, 
of 180. And so, did I do that right? So let's see, I think we deface, I deface the opposite direction, that's okay. So now uh, we do a 180, so like that, and that will flip us, a 180 around the Y, flip us over to there. And let's see, deface that way, deface. Let me do it the way I have got it written in the in, in the notes. So, so we we initially um, deface this direction. Okay. Yeah. So we initially deface that direction. Then we do a 180, and so. And we're doing a 180 around the y-axis. So, so basically, we go like that over to here. So that's the 180. And then we uh, deface again like that. So that's the, that's the second one here. OK, so when we look at that, um, we could have replaced, replaced that with just immediately doing a 180. So if we had done a 180 immediately like this, we would have ended up in the same place. And so that's, that's this guy. So this is, <coughs> this is just basically a regular spin echo just viewed uh, in, this, in this new way. So we do our initial 90. So, so this is our, our initial 90. Uh, we have some uh, dephasing, uh, and then we do a 180. We have some more dephasing, and uh, then uh, you end up basically in the same place you would have if you had just not allowed any dephasing and just did a 180. So, so that's one little rule that you can use for kind of substituting, substituting. Uh, uh, sequences of RF pulses and or 180s. Okay, so let go, let's go to the second one quickly. So the second one is we do a flip around the y-axis, and then we do a 180 around the y-axis, and then we do the minus flip. So the minus of the flip angle. Uh, around the y-axis. And so that one turns out to be uh, also uh, just equal to, to the 180 around the y-axis. So what does that one look like? So that one is uh, we uh, start, so we start here again at some, some random place. That's our starting point after the 90. And then we, we essentially rotate around the y-axis. So we rotate that guy around the y-axis so that it's going to uh, sort of um, come up uh, like something like that. Uh, caused by the flip now, not, not caused by the dephasing. So this is, this is actually, you know, flip um, flip, flip, okay. So um, we come up some uh, certain amount there, uh, and then we do a 180. And so 180 is going to put us down over here. So that's our, this is our 180. This guy was the, the, f the actual, another flip around the y-axis. And then we just do uh, the negative of that flip. So here's the here's the you know negative uh, flip angle there. Uh, and so you, know, you, you might wonder, like negative flip angle, what does that mean? It has to do with the phase of the flip angle, and that will be equivalent to if we had just immediately done a 180, because we'll end up in the same place. So that's our. That's our, our, our second rule. 
And then our third rule is has, has to do with uh, the phase, but now we're going to have to sort of consider our uh, off-center situation. So this guy is... Um, we do a flip at some random phase, and then a 180, and then we do um, another flip at the negative phase. So here's the opposite phase, and we'll, we'll illustrate what that means. And that one uh, also equals just a 180 flip. So that's our third one. So how does that one go? That one. So we start off like we were before over here, and, and this is this is our phase angle here. Uh, of the m vector. This is all the m vector. You know, all m. So this one's a little harder to draw. Let's try to do it. So, so now we do a flip uh, around this uh, offset axis. So that's going to... Uh, it's going to look like something like that. Uh, wait, no, let's see. I got start M. I see. No, sorry. Man, yeah, I knew this one was complicated. So that's that's the the phase axis, but the vector is somewhere out here. So here's our starting vector. And then here's the our phase axis. So this guy is the is that phase angle. And so what we're going to do so the that's this is the m vector. And then here's the phase angle of our RF pulse. Okay, so that's different. That's 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 this phase angle, not that that phase angle. Okay, so the phase angle of the RF pulse. And so now what's going to happen is we're going to rotate around this axis. And so so basically we'll sort of like head up in this direction. So that's our uh, that's our you know alpha at a particular phase. Now uh, we'll do a 180 around the y and so that will will basically take us uh, somewhere like this. So that's our 180 around the y. And then last but not least, we do the negative of the, fl of the flip. And so here's the negative phase angle in this direction. This guy is, you know, negative phase. And so instead of going that way, we're going to go back. And so we'll go back this way. So this guy was the negative So once again, we will end up at the same place as we would have been if we had just done a 180 uh, to start with. So that one's kind of a bit of a mess, but uh, you can sort of see the, the general idea. So why would you do this? So uh, in the last minute, we'll explain how you would use this kind of uh, these kind of rules. So to make a hyper echo sequence, uh, which has like a nice, really big echo somewhere. And one of the, again, one of the motivations that I didn't mention at the beginning is that uh, here we're using, you know, smaller flips just, and then just a few 180s. And so one of the problems with a 180 degree flip is it deposits a lot of RF power. And so you actually want to avoid using them as much as you can because you can run over the limit of how much you can heat the subject. And so what we want to do is use a bunch of small flips so that we can collect all the data in k-space and just have a few 180s, sort of strategically placed 180s that will give us a nice big signal. And so, so here's an example of 
one of those uh, one of those sequences. So, so here's our here's our set of uh, set of flips. So we start off with a ninety. So here's our ninety, and then we do a series of smaller flips. So the smaller flips, say we do one like that, uh, and then. How many do I need? Uh, Got to put it a little closer. So here's like that. And then uh, there's where the echo is. And then let's do uh, a bigger one here. And then do uh, a really small one here. Then do a 180 here in the middle. Then we'll do, using these rules, which I erased, uh, we'll now do uh, a upside down small one, which is, has, you know, the negative phase. So this is like the a negative phase RF pulse, but the same size as this RF pulse. And then we'll do uh, a negative big one here. Uh, using basically using this this third rule, and then we'll do um, a uh, upside down really small one, and then finally uh, we're going to get our hyper echo. So so what comes out? So what comes out is. Uh, a whole bunch of FIDs. <coughs> so, so if we look at the you know, signal coming out of here, what we see is you know you you've got all these. I'll put them in red. So you have all these FIDs, most of which you're ignoring. There's another one here, another one here, a little one there, none here if that's a, a good 180, and then another one here, a bigger one here, a bigger one here. And then we get the echoes, and so the echoes, the echoes are going to be here. So we'll get an echo here, and another echo here, another echo here. So you know, we've got to cover lots of lines of K space, and so we're we're getting all these echoes. But because we've Use these rules to sort of preserve our our magnetization and put everything back. We get a huge echo here. So this is the hyper echo. So there's the the hyper echo, nice big echo. Uh, and so we only have to do we only have to do essentially one. Uh, so this is like a particular phase of one, particular phase of two, particular phase of three. And then we just do minus and minus phase of two, minus phase of three. So this is our, you know, this is our alpha one. Here's our negative alpha one. Okay, so I, this time I, first year, I managed to get all the diagrams uh, more or less correct. But so basically, what this is is just a way of sort of visualizing the magnetization vector phase on a sphere, and then using it to um, set up some rules that will allow us to just do. One 180, because 180s are simpler because they just sort of flip. They don't cause any FID. There's no uh, problem with stimulated echo. But the problem with them is they have a lot of power. So they have like, you know, six times the power of a 90. Six times power of a 90 degree. And so you can easily sort of go over your limit on how, how many 180s you can do. And so this way, this is a way to sort of like optimize your sequence or sort of think about optimizing your sequence. So I don't know if that was helpful at all, but it's just it's just yet another way of sort of 
really visualizing the, uh, what, the, what the phase of the M vector means and, and what the phase of the stimulating RF pulse means. So, okay, well, I'm, I'm just over the limit, so I think we'll end there, Stan, before we go over 